Amen. You know, I don't know how other ministers prepare for their Sunday sermon. I'm a member of a small church pastor's forum. I've told you this before, and I notice that there are some pastors that around the end of January will post on that forum that they have all of their Sunday sermons already planned for the whole year. Now, that might work out really good for them, but I'm not able to do that. My sermon prep each week always begins with praying and asking God to impress upon me what he would like for me to say. And then I try to be sensitive to things that I see, to things that I hear, to things that I read, and God has never failed yet to give me a thought to preach about that I feel like came from him. This week, uh, I'll admit that initially, when God gave me uh, the thought that I'm going to give to you, I pushed back a little bit. Uh, and the reason why I push back is because that what I will bring you this week seems to me to be a subject that I have preached about and that we have talked about a lot over the past six months. But after pushing back and being told by God to stay in my lane and just do what I'm told, I decided to obey him. So I will tell you that the simple message that I'm going to bring you today, frankly, is a word that perhaps one or maybe none will feel like you need it right now in your life. Someone may walk away after hearing this message and say to themselves that God really spoke to them today. I don't know. My personal experience has shown me that the message that I'm going to bring to you today may not be needed in your life or in my life right now. But at any moment, we might fa be facing circumstances that could cause us to reach back into the archives of our mind and apply this message to our spirit like a soothing ointment to a wound. My message begins today by reading a scripture text that talks about the beginning of what must be the absolute most well-known story in the Bible. I'm going to read to you from the book of Luke. And what I'm going to read for you is the biblical record of how that an angel of the Lord visited a man named Zechariah and told a fantastic story of how he and his wife Elizabeth would have a baby boy, even though he and his wife were well beyond normal childbearing age. And just like the angel said, God did give Zechariah and Elizabeth a baby son. And on the eighth day after the child was born, at the ceremony where the baby would be named, Zechariah announced that the baby would be named John. It was a very unusual thing for a, uh, a parent in that day, in, in especially Zechariah uh, being very prominent in the, in the uh, uh, church leadership there, the Jewish leadership. It was very unusual for him not to name his baby child after him, which I also believe he was named after his father. And so the, everyone expected when Zechariah at, uh, at that moment to say the baby's going to be named Zechariah, but... Zechariah said, we're going to name the baby John. And during that ceremony, Zechariah declared to everyone there an astounding prophecy. And here's a part of what Zechariah said. Although that newborn baby didn't understand a word of it, Zechariah was talking to him. Zechariah was telling his son what the Lord had in store for him. Notice Luke 1, verses 76 through 79. And you, child, will be called a prophet of the Most High. For you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give his people knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. Because of our God's merciful compassion, the dawn from on high will visit us to shine on those who live in darkness and the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. God gave Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth a son in the sunset years of their life. And the Lord said to name him John. And God didn't do that just because it seemed like a good thing to do. God wasn't sitting around heaven one day and the thought came into his mind. Well, I think I'll give old Zach and Beth down there in Judah a baby boy. God caused a boy named John to come into this world because John 
would be known as the baptizer and he would play a major part in the plan that God had for the salvation of all mankind. The title of my message today is simply this, God always has a plan. God always has a plan. To the reading of the word of the Lord today, I say amen and amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. God always has a plan. Now, in my natural life, there are some things that I do that I consider myself to be a planner. When I'm going somewhere, just beyond driving down the road to the grocery store, my wife will tell you that I like to make some kind of plan. What time do we need to be there? What time do we need to leave? How long will we stay? What will we do there? I have never been, nor will I ever be a person who enjoys just striking out and seeing where the day will bring me. Some of you are, I am not. Now I'm not saying that being a planner is a good or a bad thing to be. I will say that over the course of 42 years that Patty and I have been married, me being a planner and Patty being not so much <laughs> has caused a little friction at times. And I will readily admit that I take some of the blame because there have been times when I should have been less of a planner and more of a go where the flow takes me person. Dictionary.com defines a planner as someone who plans. And it returns one definition of the word plan as a scheme or method of acting, doing, proceeding, making, etc. to yield a specific project or a definite person purpose. When someone is a planner, what they are trying to do is to develop a way that they can deliver a specific project or a definite purpose. If I have a nine o'clock doctor's appointment, I will plan to leave the house at about eight o'clock, which with decent traffic will put me in the waiting room at about 820. You say that's too early. Well, you're probably right. But once, maybe once, they will take me back early. It hasn't happened yet, but a man can hope. Now I will not, now I will not say in my life, my wife will agree with me on this, I would not say that I am a planner in every aspect of my life. But when it comes to the way that I travel, I'm a planner. I like to plan a way to deliver the specific purpose of going from one place to another. Now, the fact that I'm a planner in some aspects of my life, but not in all parts of my life, is just one of the gazillion things that in which I am not like God. I cannot say that I always have a plan, but let me tell you something, my brother and my sister, our God always has a plan. Yeah. There is not a thing that happens that God does not know about. There is not a thing that happens that is not in the plan and in the will of God because God always has a plan. Yes, he does. Hallelujah. Amen. I love it when God gives me a message, message like this to preach because a message talking about how that God always has a plan doesn't really require me to come up with any fantastic dialogue or mind-blowing examples to get my point across. Everything that I need for this message is found in the pages of this book. I read it for you earlier, how that God allowed a baby boy to be born who would be known as John the baptizer. And it was the plan of God that John would be born about six months before Jesus was born. And it was the plan of God that John the Baptist would, how did Zechariah put it, go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give his people knowledge of salvation to forgiveness of their sins. It was the plan of God for a loud, boisterous, rowdy man dressed in camel's hair clothes, eating locusts, dipping wild honey, to pave the way for Jesus, the Lamb of God, to die on a cross to take away the sins of all mankind. Could God have done it without John the Baptist? Sure he could. He's God. He can do whatever he wants to do, but John was a part of the plan of God because God always has a plan. Right. Amen. Now, I could spend a lot of time today giving you scriptural examples of how that God proved that he always has a plan. God had a plan when he created Adam and Eve. 
God had a plan when he flooded the earth, saving just Noah and his family. God had a plan with Gideon, when, when Gideon defeated the entire Midian army with just 300 men and some torches and clay pots and trumpets. God had a plan when a big fish swallowed Jonah. God had a plan when the walls of Jericho came down. God had a plan when Moses stretched his rod out over the Red Sea and the waters parted. There is not a circumstance, there is not a story in the Bible when God got something to get done without having a plan because God always has a plan. But my brother and my sister, you and I can shout all day long about God's plan for Adam and Eve and Noah and Gideon and Jonah and Moses because we are convinced that God's plan worked for all of them. But at the end of the day, if we are not just as convinced that God has a plan for each of us and that God's plan will work for us just like it worked for all of them, then what we are doing is we're missing out on one of the most awesome benefits available to us as children of the Most High God. I'm preaching today that God always has a plan. And that includes the plan that he has for you. And that includes the plan that he has for me. If you were in this room right now, I'd say somebody say amen. amen. Because God always has a plan for you. Yes, God is. always has a plan for me. Amen. amen. Praise God. If I've, read, if I've read and quoted Jeremiah 29 11 once, I've read and quoted it hundreds of times. For I know the plans I have for you. This is the Lord's declaration. Plans for your well-being, not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. I played a song about it at the beginning of our session today. There is not a person listening to this message right now that is not aware of that verse. That verse didn't take you by surprise this morning. You might even have it underlined in your Bible. You might have it posted somewhere in your home. Jeremiah 29 and 11 might be a verse that you have memorized. You might say that it has spoken to you. And I don't doubt any of that. But let me tell you and let me tell me what I believe that God wants us to hear today. And that is that it is one thing to know about Jeremiah 29 and 11. It's one thing to memorize Jeremiah 29 and 11. It's one thing to have a bookmark in your Bible. At Jeremiah 29 and 11, it's one thing to do all of that with Jeremiah 29 and 11, but, but God wants us to know today that it's another thing altogether to live with Jeremiah 29 and 11 so deeply etched in our heart that nothing, nothing, nothing that comes our way can shake our faith in our God, that he does have a plan for us and that God is going to bring his plan to pass in our life in his time and in his way. Amen. God is trying to tell us today that he always has a plan and that if we will just wait on him, he will bring his plan for us to pass in our life. My brother and my sister, I'm preaching it today. God always has a plan. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, I know I told you I pushed back a little bit to God on this message. I know this is not a new message. I know that you're not sitting there in awe of what I'm saying to you today. Jeremiah 29 and 11 is not new. It is not fresh. But when you think about it, maybe that's part of the problem. Maybe Jeremiah 29 and 11 has become so common to us. Maybe it is a scripture that we have heard read or have read for ourselves so often that we're not able to embrace the magnitude of the fact that God, in his breathtaking greatness, has the ability, and not only the ability, but also the desire to work out a plan for each of us individually. Maybe we no longer have the real ability to let the impact of the news that the plan that God has worked out for us is a plan for our well-being. It is a plan that will allow us to avoid the disastrous pitfalls that we face in life. Maybe we are no longer impacted by the news that the personal individual plan that God has for each of us is a plan that will give us a future. It is a plan that will bring us hope when hopelessness tries to rule today and the day in our life. Amen. Hallelujah. 
If any of that is where you find yourself today, or where I find myself today, then in this message, let let me remind all of us that despite every setback, despite every challenge, despite every struggle, you need to know, and I need to know that God always has a plan. God always has a plan. God always has a plan. Say amen right where you're at. Hallelujah. God always has a plan. Hallelujah. 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 God always has a plan. Now I know that I can say what I'm about to say because I've walked this road that I'm about to talk about myself. And I know that everyone who said amen just a minute ago have either right now or at some time in your walk with the Lord experienced a time when you've walked through a valley. And although Jeremiah 29 and 11 was ringing in your mind, you still did not see how what you were, you are or were going through could possibly be a part of God's plan for you. If you were in this room right now, I'd see all your heads bobbing up and down because you know exactly what I'm talking about. Yes, we have all experienced a time in our life when we wanted to look toward the heavens and just yell, why God, why? I'm sorry, but I don't have any magic words or phrases that will help you to answer that question. But what I do have to tell you about today is a man named Job. Everyone knows about the story of Job in the Old Testament, but let me remind you of a couple of things in the story. You see, if ever there were a person in the Bible whose story gives life to Jeremiah 29 and 11, it's the story of Job. Job was a man who lived such a perfect and righteous life before God that Satan didn't even bother to try and have an influence on him. Job chapter 1 and verse number 1 tells us that Job was a man of complete integrity who feared God and turned away from evil. You know the story. One day, Satan was standing before God and God did a very unusual thing. Job 1 and 8. Job uh, chapter 1 verse number 8. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? No one else on earth is like him a man of perfect integrity who fears God and who turns away from evil. For the sake of time, I will not try and read every verse of the story of Job, but let me highlight a few things. After the Lord asked Satan that question, Satan told God that he couldn't even get close to Job because God had such a hedge of protection around him. And again, you need to read the book of Job for yourself because I'm leaving out a whole lot of the details. Anyway, as the story goes, God decided to let Satan take a run at Job. Job chapter 1, verses 13 through 19 tells us what Satan caused to happen to Job. Notice this. First, the Sabians took Job's oxen and donkeys, killing his servants who were with them. Next, fire from heaven burned up Job's sheep and his servants who were with them. Next, the Chaldeans took Job's camels, killing his servants who were with them. And next, a great wind killed all of Job's children by causing the collapse of his oldest son's house where they had been eating and drinking together. So just just in case you're keeping score, Satan took all of Job's oxen and donkeys and sheep and camels. In addition to Job losing all of his animals, he also lost all of the servants who were caring for his flocks. But that's not all. After losing his animals and servants, Job also lost all of his children. That's not all. It even gets worse. For Job, chapter 2, verse 7 through 10 tells us that Satan caused Job to have horrible, disgusting, painful, pus-oozing sores from the top of his head to the tips of his toes. And not only that, next, Job's wife, instead of trying to be a beacon of encouragement in Job's life, in Job chapter 2 and verse number 1 tells us, And his wife said to him, Are you still holding on to your integrity? Curse God and die. Like I told you earlier, there's a lot more to this story. You need to read it. But my message title is, God Always Has a Plan. And I want to tie the story of Job to my message today. 
Job, a man whose godly integrity and righteousness is unmatched by anyone outside of Jesus Christ. Job lost everything that was important to him. Job even lost his health. He lost everything except his wife. And I just have to believe that the mind of mankind being what the mind of mankind is, surely, surely sometime during his ordeal, Job must have had the thought enter his mind as to why this was happening to him. And where was God in it all? Job may have wondered where his walk in the valley was going to take him, but Job knew enough about his God to make it possible for Job in Job chapter 13 to respond to some wicked statements made to him by a man named Zophar. Job 13 verse 15, Job said this to Zophar, though he, meaning God, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. But I will maintain my own ways before him. Did you catch those four words. Job, even when he could not understand why he was going through what he was going through, Job said of his God, I trust in him. I told you earlier that Job was a man whose story gives life to Jeremiah 20 and 11, 29 and 11. And although Job was going through a dark, dark valley, still he knew enough about his God to know that God had a plan for him so he declared, I trust in him. Trust in God for what, Job? I trust in God to bring about his plan for me, to completion in my life, whatever that plan is. Let me read Jeremiah 20, 11 one more time, just so you, you, you're, it's fresh for you. I know the plans I have for you. This is the Lord's declaration. Plans for your well-being, not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. I'm preaching that God always has a plan. Here's how jo Jeremiah 29 11 worked out for Job. God said, I have a plan for your well-being. God said, I have a plan not for disaster, but for success. God said, I have a plan for your future. God said, I have a plan that will give you hope. You got to read all the way to the last chapter of the book of Job, chapter 42, to find out how Jeremiah 29 and 11 worked out for Job. Job 42 and 16 reads, after this, Job lived 140 years and saw his sons and his son's sons, even four generations, God's plan for Job's well-being came to pass. Job 42 verse number 10 reads that the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. God's plan for Job's success came to pass. Job 42 verse uh, number 12 reads, so the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning, for he had 14,000 sheep and 6,000 camels and a thousand yoke of oxen and a thousand she asses. God's plan for Job's hope, God's plan for Job's future came to pass. I don't know how long it took for Job to experience all of God's plan for his life, but regardless of how long it took, Job trusted in his God during the process, and Job got everything that the plan of God had for him. I don't know how long you and I are going to have to wait for God's plan to come to pass in our life. But I do know this, God always has a plan for us. And if we do like Job did and trust in our God during the waiting period, then we like Job will realize all of the plan that God has for us. My brother and my sister, let's not just live with Jeremiah 20 and 11 in our life but rather let's allow Jeremiah 29 and 11 to be words that gives us strength to declare in spite of everything, I trust in my God because although I cannot possibly understand it, I still know that God always has a plan. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Isaiah chapter 40, verse number 31 is another of those often quoted verses that sometimes loses an impact in the midst of dark valley times. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. I'm not a person who enjoys waiting. When I need something, I want to get it right now. Waiting on God is not easy. But if you are a Bible believer, 
then you will find truth in what the psalmist David had to say about waiting on the Lord. Notice Psalm 130 and 5, I wait for the Lord and I wait to put my hope in his word. Psalm 33 and 20, we wait for the Lord. He is our help and shield. Psalm 37 and 7, be silent before the Lord and wait expectantly for him to do not agitated by one who prospers in his way, but by the person who carries out evil plans. Verse 34, wait for the Lord and keep his way and he will exalt you to inherit the land. You will watch when the wicked are destroyed. And finally, David wrote in Psalm 27 and 14, wait for the Lord, be strong and let your heart be courageous. Wait for the Lord. Today I preached about God always has a plan. And I'll close by reading Psalm 27 and 14 one more time. Wait for the Lord. Be strong. Let your heart be courageous. Wait for the Lord. Wait for the Lord because God always has a plan. God always has a plan. God always has a plan. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. To the word of the Lord today, I say amen and amen. Will you pray with me right now?